Good evening, Michael. Hi, everyone. Great to see so many people. Okay, we have several others are joining. So a couple of minutes, then we, we will start. Okay, so let, let's start now. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome uh, to this new webinar of the, the Chisholm Analysis Society series, but this is a special event because it is actually a joint webinar between the, the Chisholm Analysis Society and uh, the Society of the Chisholm Professionals. And uh, together we present uh, the DAS SDP webinar. So it's an, a joint occasion and uh, we are very glad to have here Professor Yale grushka Kane. She will talk about the Tham Luang Cave rescue, this is a making with high stakes. Uh, before we, we actually go to the webinar, which uh, will be so interesting, so we'll try to be uh, very fast. Uh, let's say a few words. The first is joint with the Society of Decision Professionals that uh, you can, you know, is the society that tries to bring the practice component also to decision analysis to truly serve the best interest of the decision maker. Uh, you see here also the website of the STP. Uh, for the Decision Analysis Society, let me go quickly through the agenda. Uh, if you want to mark down your calendar for the next events, uh, so I will not talk about this at the end, but just now very quickly. On March 3rd, we will have a, a webinar on promoting diversity, equity and inclusion. As, uh, uh, as I announced also earlier on, also during the webinar with Ilya on December, we have a new diversity, equity and inclusion committee. And uh, this will be the first uh, initiative to uh, get to know the members of the committee and also promote uh, these important topics throughout our society. It will be a joint uh, webinar with Catherine Devry, who is a uh, uh, vice rector at Bukun University for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. We will have Susan Martonozzi and Ahita Koyandi, who are representatives of the at Informs, uh, Alison Riley, uh, Andrea Hubman, and Jun Zhuang uh, from uh, the Decisionalist Society. On April 6th, uh, James Dyer and James Smith uh, will talk about the contribution of decision analysis to management science. It will be another uh, Decisionalist Society webinar. March 3rd it will be on 10 EST. On April 6th, it will be on 12, so this time. Um, also, uh, we are ready to start for the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee, and we will be calling for volunteers. So we uh, will receive an email about volunteering for this committee, which is a permanent committee for the society in the next few days. Uh, I also wanted to uh, personally congratulate Alison, Andrea and June as they submitted uh, a proposal as day ambassadors for the part of the day ambassadors informs grant awards and actually the proposal was funded. And part of the proposal is also uh, to use these funds to increase uh, inclusion and participation at the ADA 2022, so the Advantage in the Season Analysis Conference. ADA will be in Darden, where exactly Yale is professor. So uh, maybe I will leave the floor immediately to Yale so you can also talk about uh, this event. And uh, just briefly, Professor Yale Gluska cocaine she's full professor at Darden Business School. She has one an amazing number of awards, as you can read from uh, the, the, the bio that appears here and also on our webinar page. She's uh, since several years an associate editor of operations research and management science, and one of the top researchers in our field. Uh, her topic is very interesting, so I leave her immediately the floor. Thank you again, Yale, for being here, and we look forward to your webinar. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Do you want to bring back the slide for the ADA? Do you want me to say a few words about that yeah. before I dig in? Yes. That, so just brief. Thank you so much for bringing it. Thank you all for being here today. It's wonderful to see your names, and uh, some of you have your pictures, so your faces. If I could, I would uh, enable videos in our webinars um, uh, to see to see everybody because it's great to get together. We're excited to hopefully see folks in person. Um, hoping, fingers crossed, that uh, we can pull it off. Um, we haven't had an ADA since we were in Milan, where we had the wonderful conference a few years ago, and hopefully um, folks will join us in June, late June, uh, in, in the Roslyn, D.C. area, so it's across the river from our first ADA, uh, across the river from Georgetown, we have this amazing facility, 
um, overlooking uh, the Potomac. Um, more details are available online. We've shared abstract submissions. Abstracts have been being submitted all the time, and we're excited to see the, the quality of the submissions. Uh, June, Sasha, and Jay are organizing research incubators, PhD incubators, so send us the students, uh, suggest that they present work, even if it's in initial stages, there'll be folks giving feedback and really opportunities to get um, uh, good feedback on early stage research. Um, and uh, thanks to the entire committee, there's a huge committee number of people involved in this conference, and so we're super excited. And registration information is going to come out um, any day now, so uh, watch your inboxes for your, the information about uh, registration. Abstract submission closes March 1st, so uh, there's another month or so, and then uh, we'll close uh, abstract submission. So thank you so much, and we're excited to have everybody there. If you have any questions about the conference, uh, please feel free to ping uh, Manel, who co is co-chairing it with me, uh, Emmanuel, or myself, um, or anybody on, that, on the organizing uh, committee. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you, Yale, and now let's go to your webinar. Wonderful, you. so I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, I am going to share my screen and make sure that everybody can see it. Let's see that you guys can see it. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, let At me see if I, I can, can get rid of my uh, control. Okay, beautiful. So hopefully you guys can see, um, see my screen. I wanted to start by saying um, thank you all for being here and thank you, Emmanuel, and for the society. And this is a joint session with um, SDP. So thank both societies and both groups for willing to do something slightly different. Um, we've been experimenting with these webinars. We've had information sessions. We've had a lot of great research talks. Um, and today I'm going to present uh, basically a case, uh, a case study that I've uh, published, I think it's been out now formally and available to the public uh, about a year and a half now um, that I wrote. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about basically the story and the fascinating, absolutely breathtaking um, if development of events that occurred in 2018, in June and July of 2018, um, and see you know, what we can learn and be inspired by this unbelievable story. Um, so it's something different. When I teach cases, as you know, at Darden, we teach here with cases. I wrote this during my time at HBS that also teaches with cases. Uh, many of you here actually adopt a case uh, study approach in your classes and in your engagements. So hopefully you'll be inspired to use it. Um, but when I teach, I typically like a very conversational kind of situation or I have a discussion going and students come ready to pre uh, pre and prepared to engage in a dialogue. I can't quite pull that off in a webinar, um, but hopefully we will hear some voices. Uh, we asked Informs and Beth has been so kind to make sure that you all have the ability to unmute yourselves. Um, and hopefully we'll get folks either asking questions or answering some of the questions that I'll pose or using the chat or the Q&A. We have all of these kind of ways in which we can get some engagement here. Um, because I think that um, hopefully you'll all be taken by this story and you'll have a lot of interesting either thoughts or questions or, um, um, you know, inspirations to share. And so please, please, please express that uh, uh, in any way that you can. If you want to uh, say something, you can either type it in the chat or you can try to raise, uh, I believe some of you have the raise hand button, um, or just let me know that you want to ask a question and I'll let you um, ask a question and you can unmute yourself and we can hear your voice. Um, as you know, I teach cases all the time, and we write new cases on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, my cases are typically, you know, received pretty well. Um, I will say that one of the reasons I'm excited to bring this case here today is that from my experience teaching it, and I've done that for the past couple of years, it is one that absolutely um, sits with students. They're blown away by it. They keep emailing me and um, expressing how meaningful it was and how it's really been an incredible case to, uh, to, to read and to experience. Uh, sometimes I have some guest speakers from the folks that I'll share with you that I interviewed and I got to know really well. Um, and it really makes people think about just opportunities, life, organizations, how to deal with moments of crisis, how to trust our gut and our intuition, how to think about um, different cultures and different languages. Uh, it's a truly international case. 
Um, and it's a kind of, for me, it's been uh, humbling to see uh, what people do for one another when they don't know each other, uh, when there's really no reason for them to be in that place, when they're not necessarily paid for it, um, and how people go out of their way to, uh, to save lives and to, to help each other out in moments of crisis. So hopefully it will be uplifting and inspirational to you, um, but, uh, but time will tell. Um, so please uh, read the case uh, if you get a chance. Um, and, and today what I'll do is I'll kind of walk you through the highlights. I'll tell you the story and I'll pause to share, share some anecdotes around lessons learned or um, you know, the type of lens that we can cast on certain uh, developments that occurred over time or, or ways to think about this problem and how it evolved and how it changed over time. As I mentioned, um, this is a case study that I wrote during my time at HBS. There's actually two cases. There's an A case and a B case. Um, and you'll see in my presentation here today, the separation here, it's a pretty natural separation. The A case is about the search uh, and the B case is about the rescue. Um, I wrote the cases with um, two other HBS professors, um, uh, Francesca Gino and Gary Pisano. Many of you may know them very well or use their materials very well. Uh, Francesca is more in the negotiations and um, um, behavioral um, side of things. And Gary does a lot of work on project management, like I do a lot of work on organizations and agility. And they teach this case in a variety of different courses. So uh, what's also interesting for, for us is that there's multiple facets by which to look at this case and to think about it. Um, and, and I'll just bring a few insights throughout my conversation here. I'll highlight a few insights, but hopefully you'll, you'll find your own, draw your own conclusions from the case. Um, there, it's also timely in some ways. Um, the Oscars are upon us. And for those of you who like to watch documentaries, um, there is a, you know, late in the fall or earlier this year, uh, this academic year, there uh, was a new movie that came out. There's been many movies about this um, whole story. It clearly is one that fascinates a lot of people for the reasons that hopefully I'll highlight today. Um, and the movie is, um, it's online now, you can stream it on Disney Plus. Has anybody seen the movie? If you have, either raise your hand or type in the chat that you've seen it. I'm just curious to know uh, if folks have seen it. Um, my suspicion is, is that we'll see it in the um, Oscars as a documentary nominated for an award. Um, and I highly, highly recommend it um, if you are fascinated by why you're here today, if you're taken by the story, hopefully you'll spend some time and, um, and watch it uh, uh, in your free time. Uh, can folks type in the chat? I wanna, oh, I know that actually I saw, I see that Robin tested that. So I know that you can, and nobody here saw the movie. Could that be? Oh, I see somebody raising their hand. Okay, Dave, sorry. Okay, Dave, good. I know, now I know that somebody has seen it. So that's good uh, and, and reassuring. Um, so in a way, uh, it's reassuring that I, at least the technology works and I can get that feedback, uh, but it's also an opportunity because maybe I'm gonna be exposing some of you to this story um, for the first time. Um, and, and, and so I'm, I'm glad, because I think that it's one that you, you probably wanna be aware of and that you'll, you'll learn a lot from. Um, there are other movies coming about this rescue mission. It's been highly publicized. Um, and so I know that there's also a fiction movie coming out, but I highly recommend at this point, I recommend this documentary specifically because it's very, very well done. It's made by um, those who directed um, Free Solo. So Oscar winning documentary uh, folks. Um, so take that as a, as a movie recommendation. And if those of you who know me know that I'm obsessed with movies and I like to recommend them. Uh, so this is, is just another instance of that. So how did I come to write this case? So why did I uh, write this case? Um, I, um, I, maybe you guys remember, go back, you know, now it's like three and a half years ago, okay? This was June of uh, 2018, so uh, pre-COVID, you know, when our world was very different. Um, but what started to emerge in the press is day by day, we started to see these headlines and it kind of started to propagate across the various uh, news outlets. And it was a truly global set of reports 
that came out day after day about a group of boys that went missing. These were, they're often called soccer, play, soccer boys. They're all part of the same soccer team. And I'll tell you a little bit more, they went missing after a practice on a Saturday, uh, but they formed this wild boar group, uh, uh, wild boar soccer, I should say football group um, that, um, that went missing. And people knew that they were, went into the cave. We'll talk about the evidence that, uh, that was uh, on the ground to the fact that they were in the cave. But day after day, they weren't found. And so these headlines, okay, June 24th was the first dead date when things starting to appear. Next, 25th, another headline in the newspaper, divers in Thailand, you know, they're looking in the cave for this missing team and their coach, 12 boys and a coach. Uh, you know, June 26th, this is already three days later, three days after they entered the cave, four days after they entered the cave, 27th. 28th, 29th, 30th. This is like a week later and you're noticing these headlines and they still haven't found the boys. And slowly the whole world realized and everybody was holding their breath. And at the same time, the belief that they would be found and found uh, safe and sound inside this cave was slowly diminishing. As these headlines were emerging and as days were going by, a lot of very interesting things developed on the ground. And um, I was kind of breathtaking. I was like following this. I couldn't stop reading about it. I was really mesmerized and fascinated by the story. And as you'll hear from me later today, you'll see why my interest in this story just became stronger and stronger as the days went by. To the point where I said, I am so inspired. I know that there is so much to think about here in the situation with how do we understand risk, what decisions were made, how is planning getting done, who is organizing, who is developing contingencies. I was just fascinated by this whole um, uh, concept of um, 13 boys stuck in a dark cave. We, the world outside doesn't really know where they are or if they're alive or how to find them or how to get them out if they were to be found. Um, and I wanted to learn more. I wanted to learn more because very rarely do we actually see these projects and these instances that are high stake like this one. I teach, some of you know, I teach project management, I teach decision analysis, I teach decision making in the context of project ma um, management, I teach project planning and uncertainty. And very rarely do I have the opportunity to think about projects like this that have uh, such high stakes, human lives, such levels of ambiguity, and all of this will be affecting uh, really how things evolve. So that's the inspiration. And I'm trying to build that tension um, to make sure that you guys uh, just see and, and, and recognize that what you might see, feel here just by you know, seeing a few headlines, add that to media and reports and rain and weather and monsoon coming, this was a very, very stressful time. And um, this was a situation that very rarely we find ourselves in, okay? And I wanted to see what can I learn from it? What can I be inspired by? How can I be inspired by it? How can I inspire others like my students or others to kind of uh, think about things differently? So um, at the heart of the story, it's a story about 12 boys, 12 boys and their coach. You'll see in a picture in a moment that their average age is uh, you know somewhere around 14 or 15, so about the age of my son. Um, uh, they were practicing uh, football or soccer on a Saturday, and uh, they decided after practice to go on a stroll. Nothing unusual. They weren't being rebellious. They weren't taking unusual levels of risk. They were doing something that they often did, which was to go to these local caves and to explore. They were spending time together. They were very close to each other. They still are very close to each other. And um, they went to a known spot nearby, a very uh, well-known tourist air, a touristic spot uh, to explore the caves. This is late June. So we're talking June 23rd here now. And um, I will say that uh, they also knew that the caves would be open. The, these caves typically close down for the, for the monsoon season, but typically that happens early July. So they were about a week away from the caves being uh, shut down and closed. And the reason these caves shut down for the monsoon season is because what happens in these caves is that they get flooded with water. When there's a lot of heavy rain outside, the rain uh, enters into the cave and these caves very quickly 
get um, submerged in water. And so they shut down and they're closed. But this was still June. Yes, there was some rain the days before that, but the clays were still open and they went together um, as a group. You'll see that they were very well organized. They took some flashlights, they organized their bikes, they put everything in place. They weren't um, necessarily trying to do anything that was provoking uh, any specific kind of dare or anything that was risky. They were doing something that in their mind was pretty, pretty standard. Um, I also wanted to kind of pause on this picture for a moment and say that a little bit of a disclaimer, um, and again, I know that Dave saw the movie, but as you watch the movie, and maybe as you read the case study, if you, if you take it, if you read it after this um, session, you'll see that the boys' voices is um, somewhat absent from the, from the documentary, from the record, from the case study. So we interviewed many different people. Uh, and represented many different perspectives. We did not interview the boys or the coach or their families. Um, neither did the documentary really represent that, that perspective. Um, and you can, you can take it for what it's worth. Um, we were told that the boys preferred to kind of get their privacy back. They had a lot of media attention, they had a lot of exposure, and they wanted to go back to their lives. We didn't necessarily push on that, we were very respectful, and we understood uh, that perspective and, and really uh, respected that dearly. Um, the folks that we are in touch with are the folks that I contacted, the, the doctor that, uh, that you'll hear about later and, and other representatives, um, they are still in touch with the boys who are all doing great and are doing fine and, and, and you know, they're, they're, they're older teenagers by now. Um, but I just kind of wanted to say that it's not totally missed upon us that that, that perspective is not kind of uh, heard throughout the, the case or the, or the movie, but I'll talk specifically about the case. Um, and that's, um, you know, it could be that in the future that's going to yield a lot of interesting insights. I know it's going to yield a lot of interesting insights because they survived uh, in, the, in the cave under uh, harsh conditions. But, um, and I'm not, I'm not trying to have a spoiler here, but I also want to make sure that folks know that um, they, they did survive under very harsh conditions. Um, and there's probably a lot of interesting and absolutely inspirational things that we can learn from their time in the cave. Uh, we focus on the work outside. We focus on all of the organizations and the people that came together and the activity that was outside of the cave. And, um, and that is the, the, pri the prim primary kind of perspective that we take throughout um, the narrative in the case. Um, okay, so that's, that's about the boys. Uh, take a look at them. You'll see them again. Don't worry, I have more um, footage. Um, okay, anybody been to Thailand? Folks been to Thailand? I know you can raise your hand. Hopefully folks will raise their hand. Go, oh, good. I see quite a few folks have been to Thailand, okay. Um, this, um, the location of the caves, of these caves where the boys ventured in and where they live is in Northern Thailand. So Chiang Mai area, if you've been there, beautiful, uh, uh, very hilly kind of uh, uh, topography, very um, uh, picturesque and scenic area with a lot of great tourism, lots of caves, lots of mountains. Um, uh, so folks go and come and visit this region for that. Um, cavers, uh, folks who do climbing and caving, they know the region and it's known for, for these types of um, uh, excursions and opportunities. And so this region is, is a known tourist site. It's not as if it wasn't a known tourist site. You'll see that the cave is pretty well uh, um, organized and structured. Um, and so the region is uh, North Thailand and it does suffer or North, North, uh, West or mostly North uh, of Thailand. It does suffer from monsoon. So come the summer, they get huge amounts of rain uh, in a pretty intense kind of window that typically peaks around August, but it's known to start late June and July uh, and peak around August and September. Okay. Has anybody in, been in these actual caves before? I don't, I don't know if folks have actually been. Mike, do you have a question? Oh, uh, Sanjay, go ahead. Have you been in these caves? Can you share with us? Not in this case, but <clears throat> I'm from India, Meghalaya. There are a lot of caves, if you have heard about it. Okay, and yes, and have you, have you visited them? Do they also get kind of uh, submerged in water during the monsoon yes, season? Yes, yes, you are correct. During the monsoon season, they are submerged and they, uh, tourists are not allowed to go there. Okay. And you are talking about the rescue and the search team. I actually personally saw that 
in the coal mine the workers got uh, trapped there and by <clears throat> 15 to 20 days they were there and like the rescuers could not uh, help them out yeah because the water was too much flooded there in the coal mines and ultimately like they just brought the dead bodies yeah so there are um uh so thank you for sharing there are instances and we can talk a little bit depending on time um towards the end of my uh presentation here i have a few other kind of uh crises or or uh these types of extreme events uh, that also get taught and that we've learned and been inspired by um, that I'll mention. There are some similarities. There are some very important differences in terms of the lessons learned. Um, some stories end in disasters where, uh, where lives are lost. Um, and again, I, you know, I'm foreshadowing a little bit here, but I, I, because it's a short webinar, I want to make sure that people know that the boys are safe at the end. Um, um, and we're just going to by the end of it, hopefully you'll understand how mind boggling it is that they actually are, but, um, uh, but that is the situation. So thank you, um, uh, Sanjay, for, sh for sharing. Mike, your hand is still up. Is that an old hand or do you want to add something? You've visited this area as well. Is Mike there? I don't know if Mike hears me. <laughs> okay, I will continue. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, what happens or what, what turned out, um, I'm a kind of big picture here. This is a little bit of an overview. This is uh, my project kind of uh, uh, definition, project framing mindset kind of wants to kind of, again, highlight the scale and the, the degree of ambiguity in this case. Uh, we are talking about 12 boys and a, co and a coach lost in a cave. Um, the beginning, uh, the goal was to find them, but it really wasn't clear what the scope of this project was going to evolve into. Are we going to find them alive? Or are we going to find them uh, not alive? Are they going to be dead? Are we going to have to retrieve them, their bodies, as we just heard, like other uh, previous instances that had occurred? Or if we find them alive, what are we going to do then? What are the conditions going to be? How are we going to rescue them? There are so many levels of, uh, of ambiguity here that the scope was very vague. And every day that passed, that scope was evolving and changing. Timing. Timing was a, a constraining factor here in the sense that it was closing in on them. Uh, primarily at this point, at the beginning, especially, the, the real concern was the monsoons. Any day now, the monsoon, monsoon season was going to start. It was out of their control. They could not do anything to postpone that. And that monsoon season was going to fundamentally change the conditions to a point where they could not progress in the way that they got there. So that this looming sense, this risk that was right in front of them, that the monsoon season was at the doorstop. And by the way, the rain was occurring, like as the days that I'm going to describe to you evolve, rain was falling and there were days that it was torrential rain. People couldn't, couldn't really uh, get into the cave. They knew that this was just a matter of time before they had to stop the entire um, uh, search and the entire operation. And then finally, from a budget perspective, um, uh, clearly in situations like this, uh, uh, there, nobody declares a budget upfront like we do in typical projects in other settings. Um, but the scale of this and as things evolve, the scale and the investment were such that we're talking about, you know, uh, hundreds uh, of, of, uh, of thousands of dollars. Um, uh, and really, they just pulled no stops, right? Like, organized various volunteers to come, paid for them to come, uh, asked other governments to send uh, volunteers, uh, uh, really helped get people there, invested in pipes and, and in, in uh, all kinds of special pumps. Um, companies were donating money and donating equipment. You'll see that there was really no sense of, of limit in terms of the resources that were being poured into this project, um, which is just interesting. Again, most of the framing, most of the projects that I'm used to working on and presenting are very limited on this dimension. And here there was just like all, nothing was uh, limiting them in terms of what they could uh, be resourceful and bring. It was just a matter of feasibility. Would it actually make a difference? Okay, so um, I'm gonna go through some of the events um, to give folks some more of an insight how, what, what happened. And I'm gonna, um, in between some of the events, I'm gonna pause and make certain comments to highlight where I think are interesting kind of moments or interesting opportunities or interesting either decision moments uh, that occurred, uh, trade-offs that were, were, taking, uh, were taken by individuals 
Um, so we're going to be extracting some lessons learned as we look at the timeline. Okay? And the case is really written in this way that it's a, it's a chron especially the A case, it's a chronological development of the activities. And then we analyze in class how this uh, makes us feel and how, what do we learn from it? So as I mentioned, uh, June 23rd, um, the boys enter the cave. Um, they really, you know, they were, they were just, uh, we don't know exactly when they entered, uh, uh, but they entered towards the la latter half of the day and close to, close to kind of the, the closing time. Uh, the ranger came around around 5 p.m. and really, um, uh, you know, does, did his daily checkup, the daily routine that he, he usually does, uh, the local, it was really the deputy ranger who typically shuts things down. And he suddenly sees these bikes and a motorbike on the side indicating that somebody was in there. And he was pretty surprised that, that whoever was in there was still in there. Um, he looked around, couldn't find them. And then he calls you know, the actual ranger. So the deputy and the ranger himself keep searching in the cave and they can't find anybody. There's evidence that somebody's in there. There's evidence they find their shoes neatly organized. They find some of their um, soccer or football gear there and, and, and so on very neatly positioned, uh, but they can't find the boys. Okay, and so they go and they contact the police. I see a question in uh, the chat. Um, uh, question in the chat. The question is, how does this, uh, how do these resources compare to other cases? Um, it's a good question. Um, my sense here, and this is very much. Uh, I haven't done a study to compare them across the settings, the, the Indian miners, there's also the Chilean miners. My sense is here that the, the involvement, the global involvement and the resources that came together were much higher uh, than in other instances um, where it's been, uh, still there's been a lot of international and global support, but in this instance, it was absolutely tremendous. I think the combination of the boys and, and the region and the circumstances in, uh, implied that there was a lot more attention than normal. And so you got a lot, many more resources than in most uh, of these kind of settings, but we can talk about it um, towards the end of, of the session as well, when I mention a few other examples. Okay, so the, so the, um, the two park rangers, they call the police um, and slowly, um, and slowly uh, parents start, start start showing up. They realize that the boys should have been home. Some of the other team members uh, go by and say, uh, you know, we know that they went to the caves, but they haven't made it home. The head coach now also realizes that the group went. And so they all start showing up at the cave, emergency services, volunteers, members of the public, everybody starts to descend on the cave. Okay. A lot of people that would just show up, uh, nobody called them, but they're just showing up. Somebody brings a diesel generator and puts some lighting because it's evening time already. So it's getting dark. Um, and uh, really, uh, there's a quote, rescue workers came and went, some just stood around, nobody quite knew exactly what to do. Folks were going into the cave as much as they could, um, and there were, you know, police was showing up, soldiers were showing up, so suddenly you're getting a lot more uh, awareness. This is within a few hours, like I'm not even talking, a day has passed, but just a few hours. And um, by midnight, the local governor um, is alerted and he comes to the cave um, and he starts forming um, pretty much an ad hoc uh, search team. Uh, and they start entering the cave, but they can only go so far because they're going in the cave. They know a little bit of where they're headed. Um, but every time they get to uh, what is now pretty famous, this T-junction point, and I'll show you a map in a moment, they, they can't go any further. It is already uh, uh, pretty uh, deep with water, and they realize that they can't even progress beyond that. Okay, So if you look at this imagery, and hopefully you guys can see it, um, there are many maps, and I'm happy to share. This, it's all in the case, by the way, so you can see it in the case. But there is this T-junction here Okay, that um, really is a kind of a combination. A few kind of rivers almost meet here underground. And they could only go that far. This is the entrance to the cave here, what's known, what's marked here as one, chamber one. And they could only go so far. This ad hoc team could only make so much progress and they had to turn around because it was just, there was too much water there, it was dark, and they didn't really have the capability uh, to go any further. Um, these, um, you can see here in this imagery, I'll kind of pause while we have it up and just point out that you know, these caves were studied heavily in the, in the 1980s. Um, uh, these caves form a system that is about 10 kilometers long. Okay, so all in all, 10 kilometers, you can go pretty deep in, on, underground here. 
Um, and it's really the, the caves themselves, the chambers and the, the little channels were formed by rainwater, okay, that uh, really penetrated the cave from the mountains. Outside, it's a beautiful mountain uh, ridge. Actually, some say it looks like a, a pregnant princess, um, a sleeping woman. Uh, it has a lot of uh, beautiful names. Um, but what's interesting is that they really uh, change a lot. So over time, every season, uh, chambers collapse, ceiling collapse, tunnels, they kind of go up from big chambers with some uh, area that you can sit on and it's kind of dry and it's kind of sheltered to very small, narrow tunnels and it's constantly evolving and changing. So this schematic that you see um, really over time is constantly evolving. It's never stable. It's never one that you can exactly know how the, the how it looks or how exactly it progresses. And it's one that just is full of, from season to season, it's gonna vary and change and it's very unpredictable. So as they discover it and learn, um, it's only temporary because next time they need it, it might look very different. And you'll see that um, this sense, this idea that there's a this area, this cave like this that evolves so quickly and changes so rapidly is fascinating to some. And we are very thankful that it is fascinating to some because people spend their lives studying this cave system. And so um, when the ad hoc team kind of comes and tries to work and realizes that they can't really get so far, what do they do? Well, they actually invited somebody that um, is hanging around. They just know him. He's local. His, his partner is local from that area. And this is uh, British caver Vernon um, Unsworth. Vern is um, basically a, kind of obsessed with the caves. He loves these caves. This is what he did. He, he was known by the locals to spend a lot of time uh, trying to document, trying to uh, uh, sketch, trying to really uh, get a sense for these caves is, is something that he um, uh, you know, has a, has a soft spot for, he says to it, like, he knows, he talks about it himself as he knows these caves better than anyone. Okay. Like he feels at home there. Um, it, it was a second home and he, he, he doesn't really have to think about it as much as other folks. And he's seen it evolve over time. So he was a great person to call and reach out to. And it happened to be that he was there and he was uh, uh, available to come and he showed up immediately. And when he showed up, on the 24th, so uh, you know the day, the morning after, he was shocked at just how much water was in there, given the time of year that they were in. So even he was surprised by by that ri rising water. And folks realized that they really um, they tried to use sandbags, they tried to kind of shield, they tried to prevent the water from entering the cave. But it was quickly uh, noticeable that they couldn't do it manually the, the way that they were trying. And even the pumps that they were bringing in was actually causing more damage by really creating all these fumes and all these gases that they re quickly realized was not going to be, be helpful, but actually make things much more challenging. So it was already pretty chaotic. It was, uh, um, you know, you can say an organized chaos. We'll talk a little bit about the concept of a chaos in a moment. But a lot of things were happening at once. All these people showing up, Vern showing up. He, he brought some expertise with him, but nobody really having the knowledge how to go further. The fact that there was water in these caves made them think, okay, we need experts. We need people that have the skill. Who do you go when you need uh, a skill set to deal with underwater activity? Well, you go to the Navy SEALs. And so what they did is that they went and they, um, they called for the Navy SEALs and the Navy SEALs showed up the next day. Um, and the Navy SEALs themselves, again, once they did the dive and they brought some of their knowledge and expertise, the Thai Navy SEALs, all they could do is get to the same T-junction. And that T-junction was already, you know, uh, uh, 1.8 or close to two meters deep in water, and they could only go so far. Um, another thing to highlight is that when we talk about caves filled with water, we're not talking about diving in the beautiful ocean. I don't know how many people here do diving. Do folks uh, have expertise or have you experimented with scuba diving or serious diving? Kate, where did you go diving? Where have you been diving? I don't know if you wanna unmute yourself, you can. Maybe, oh, there she, I see it in the, in the text, beautiful. So I see, you see, okay, so Bill actually ha, uh, has specific cavern uh, certification, uh, muddy rivers. So we see here, we already in this group of folks in the Decision Analysis Society and SDP, we have some folks who have 
a uh, very interesting set of experiences. So some diving in Australia, some diving in more like caverns or caves and muddy rivers, where you start to sense that there are actually different types of capabilities and skills and swamp diving and this, some, uh, um, this diving in very muddy, dark waters inside caves where you don't have the light, the natural light from uh, 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 going on top and, and rising to the, to the surface where you don't have that guiding you is a totally different set of skills than, uh, than diving in other circumstances. It is really, it really makes a fundamental difference. The type of water, the environment, the light that you have, the, 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 the air and the composition, it makes a difference to your diving capabilities and tendencies. And it became apparent in these early days that, um, that you really need that skill set. You need special equipment. You need a special type of, uh, of, of ways to breathe and ways to use your oxygen. Uh, the, the team was laying the line, what's called, they put in a line to guide divers. So they, they lay the line for the first time that they dive in there. But folks were really re recognizing that even holding on to that line and using their tank in specific ways, it's different from what you're used to. You just have to develop these skills and these capabilities in a cave to learn how to orient yourself different, to listen, to smell, and some of these features that they did not necessarily have the, the capability or the equipment to do. And so as days evolved and as the Navy SEALs failed to make progress, um, Vern um, realizes that we need, we need the, the level of above. The Thai Navy SEALs is not enough. We need people with this specific combination of skill set, okay? So as we see from the chat, you know, not exactly muddy rivers, not caverns, but specifically diving in deep caves. Um, and so Vern writes this note to the Minister of Interior and the Minister of Tourism and Sports, and he says, um, time is running out. John um, Valanthan, Richard Stanton, and Rob Harper, these are the world's experts in this very particular dive. They're in the UK. Please call them immediately and get them uh, uh, through the UK embassy. And it happened to be that uh, Vern knew them. Uh, uh, there was another woman local who knew uh, uh, Rick and had some contact. And so the numbers were written. There's this note uh, uh, that I got a picture from the Minister of uh, Tourism and Sports uh, with the actual uh, um, acknowledgement that they need that skill above. They need that next level, okay? The picture that you see here, that's Vern with the local governor um, making this claim. We need to expedite and we need to bring in the right skill set. Um, Okay, so what happens next, or um, let me pause for a second. I'll come back to the story in a minute and the timeline. I know everybody's on tenterhooks, even though you know the, the ending. Uh, but a few interesting things here. It was chaos, okay? Folks were coming and going. There's a lot of critique uh, that people are tempted to have when they first read about it, because it's clear that nobody quite knows exactly what to do. Should we pump? Should we drill? Should we uh, uh, use pipelines? Should we bring the military or civilian soldiers or police divers or not? But that kind of chaos actually implied that uh, they, they knew to reach out to, to Vern. So there was somebody making that call who sought that expertise. Uh, they reacted fast. They tried things out. They brought the Navy SEALs. They reacted to the water. That combination, you needed somebody who happened to be there who knew to recognize that you need these experts, these UK diving experts. We don't know if it wasn't for that kind of open-mindedness, whether or not Vern would be on site and whether he would have the insight to invite these other divers. Not everybody now, a lot of people know their names, but uh, uh, four years ago, they were not necessarily household names, surely not in Northern Thailand. And yet you needed to somehow get, in, get in, in touch with them as soon as possible. Another set of coincidence kind of that, you know, you can say it's luck, you can say uh, a lot of different things and we can interpret it in more detail is that the Minister of uh, Tourism and Sports was there. And um, I spoke to him, uh, an amazing uh, individual, and he tells it very bluntly. He wasn't even invited. He wasn't asked to be there. He wasn't uh, encouraged to be there. Nobody in the government came to him and said, we think you should be on site because of your role. He was sitting at home following this like a lot of other people. And his wife said to him, this is a national park. The boys are part of a, of a football, of a soccer team. You are the Minister of tourism and sports, I think you should go up there. So he went up there uninvited. He took initiative and we're thankful that he did. He, um, 
he is a fluent, he's fluent in English. And so he picked up the phone and called uh, uh, Rick and John and invited them uh, to come as soon as possible. And then he says um, another serendipitous uh, kind of component, he puts it down to serendipity, is the fact that he, in order to get uh, the divers there as soon as possible, they needed a, a plane ticket and they needed quick visa entry into the country. And he could do that within a couple of phone calls. And he puts it down to the fact that he's built relationship in their cabin and they sit by the alphabetical, by, by their name. And on his two sides, on his left and on his right, were the deputy of foreign affairs and the ministry of tourism. And so he picked up the phone, which is not common, uh, uh, I am told, in Thailand. And he said to them, I need you to help me. And within a, a day, the, or less than a day, within a few hours, the tickets were organized. Uh, uh, and, and Rick and John were, and Rob Harper were on a flight to Thailand. And they got uh, to the site as soon as they could uh, to help with the rescue. Okay, so back to the timeline. Okay, so that happened. Some of it was coincidental. Some of it, maybe we can learn from it in terms of uh, uh, um, dealing with very messy problems that we don't really know who is going to solve and how you find that expertise. But I'll come back to that uh, and I'll try and, and end on time. So we are in June 27. The boys are down already. You know, they're uh, they're law or they're gone. Four days now have passed. Uh, three, four, three and a half, four days uh, since they entered the the caves, and we still don't know where where they are and if they're alive. Um, the U.S. Special Forces, a group led by uh, Major Hodges, uh, with his um, uh, second in command Derek Anderson, they are asked and invited to come. This is there is protocol. The embassies know this. There is actually a pretty robust international system where a country in need can actually invite other special forces to come. And so they, uh, this group was located in the uh, Asian Pacific and they were um, asked to come. They have expertise in, in the logistics and running these types of operations, not specifically cave diving or rescuing, but they know how to operate in cave and in situations of crisis. And they were invited to give counsel and, and, and bring that kind of logistical expertise to the Thai military. And you'll see that they're gonna be pivotal in some of what happens. Um, later that day, um, uh, John, Rick and uh, Rob show up. Uh, they made it there pretty quickly from the moment that they were contacted. Uh, Rick was saying it was complete and utter chaos. Uh, they were volunteer rescue workers, journalists and everybody just milling around. We were um, really uh, 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 swollen up by people taking pictures and the first thing that they noticed or they felt was really nobody was in control. Um, similarly, uh, John says, initially everybody was mixed up. There were press, all kinds of different agencies, civilians wandering around and saying, how can I help you? How can I translate? A lot of goodwill, a lot of desire, but really lack of organization and clarity. And in fact, they were told not to, not to enter in the cave. They were told they're not allowed to die. They were being told, don't enter, don't dive. The Thai military, the Thai Navy SEALs and the governor uh, in place was not comfortable with them risking their lives and just wa walking into what they knew was a very risky situation. When you talk to Rick and John, they'll also say that, uh, you know, they look, they're middle-aged. I'm all for middle age, uh, but they were middle-aged. They showed up in like shorts and flip-flops, like nobody knew exactly who these individuals were. And it took a while for them to build that confidence and that trust that the team enabled them to go in. Um, the first day after they arrived, they this was already their second or third dive in the cave. Uh, they also happened to, you know, come up for air in, a, in, a, in a, one of the chambers down, down the cave. And they found four Thai water management workers that nobody knew were in there. They were there, they were part of the efforts and they got stuck there, but nobody was talking about it. Nobody knew that they were stuck in there. And that again, added to the kind of sense of, of chaos that was going around. 29th, lots of rain. Heavy rain was falling. They had to stop the dive, they couldn't. In fact, the days were going by and really they were, they were feeling the chance that the boys are in there and alive. This is already the 29th and they entered on the 23rd uh, was really the, the belief was, was wildering and, and they, they basically wanted to go home. They were about to kind of uh, decide to go home and, um, and they were kind of exploring that already. And they, they just said, he was, you know, John said, I have a quote here. He was feeling very pessimistic about their odds. Okay. They were disappointed in themselves because they kind of gave up. 
The Thai uh, government and the people and the families and everybody around did not. Everybody kept on praying and believing and, and committing to this, the continuous search. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, then at the, at the next day, you know, they, they kind of tried to encourage them and tried to kind of persuade them that, uh, that they should stay and that they should, uh, should give it another go. Okay. And these are a few pictures of John and, uh, and this is uh, Rick and John um, and, and all of their gear during that time. Okay. Um, during this time, again, a pause in the story. We're on the 29th. We're, we're still looking for the boys. Um, but at this point, I just want to kind of highlight a few other things. Uh, first, um, there were a lot of civilians and military folks on site, both in, in terms of the Thai side. There were civilians, uh, civilian Thai people that were showing up, uh, representatives from Chevron and other kind of companies uh, providing equipment. And there were a lot of military uh, organizations on site. And there was a, somewhat of a clear divide between them. And it was hard for people uh, like, for instance, the British divers to talk to the Thai military. The US military served as a great um, kind of bridge. They built the trust on both sides and they allowed kind of, they formed that kind of translation kind of capability, listening to the divers, using their expertise and trying to communicate it to the, to the military that did respect them, the Thai military that gave them space and that worked with them together. Later, there'll be other individuals that serve in that pivotal role, but it's really important to understand who can you work with that you trust that will help you communicate with other bodies and other organizations that don't necessarily, you don't trust or you don't know how to work with very efficiently. And so finding those translators and those allies was pivotal for Rick and John and the US uh, special forces served in that role. The individuals on site, the Thai people kept on pushing. They kept on believing and praying. They didn't let people uh, give up. And that was also uh, really important because it was the fuel that meant that there was still belief there and that we were gonna keep on trying. Okay, we're almost uh, at time and I wanna make sure that we get to at least uh, 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 the critical part where July 1st, the rain ease up, they get back into the cave and uh, July 2nd in the evening, after they're almost at the end of their line, at, you know, almost at the end, they're going beyond kind of their third of a tank. They're supposed to use only a third of their oxygen in their tank to keep a third to go back out and to keep a third spare. So there's like a third, a two thir a third and two thirds kind of rule. Rick and John reflect that they were at the end of that third, almost kind of exceeding it. And suddenly they come up and they smell something different. They recognize something is different. And let me just show you this footage. Yes, yeah, best you can. Thank you. How, how many of you? Thirteen. Brilliant. They surface and they find 13 of them. And as you heard, this was like real footage. Brilliant. He, they couldn't believe that they found them all alive in this cave, in the dark. These boys, they were, they were, some of them maybe got a bit teary, but they weren't overly emotional. They were, they seemed in good spirits. They seemed by and large pretty healthy. Of course, they haven't had food for 10 days. Uh, 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 you know, this is already July 2nd. They went missing on June 23rd, okay? And they found them in the cave um, uh, to the dismay and disbelief of, of basically the entire world. This video has over 26 million views online and you can find it no problem um, uh, because it is so moving and you, you can watch this footage. There's a few more minutes of it. I'm not, I'm gonna skip it right now, um, but it is uh, really kind of important to, to kind of recognize how they felt in that moment. But suddenly in that moment, everything changed, okay? And I'm gonna just skip here um, to the next my next slide uh, and skip a couple to say, well, now the boys were found. They are sound, they are safe. A huge sigh of relief by the entire world. But then they realize, wait a minute, now our problem has shifted. We have to get them out. The monsoons are still coming. The oxygen levels in that cave were dangerously low and they cannot survive in those caves for much longer. So what do we do? So now they really had to face a totally different problem and they had to figure out how do they rescue the boys? And there were three options that they really identified. And I'm speeding up just a bit because of time, 
but hopefully you can see just how rich and fascinating this story. And thank you for sticking uh, uh, with the session. Uh, if you have a few more minutes, I promise not to go too late. Uh, and I'm happy to send you all this information after the session. Three options were identified. We either drill and find an alternative way entry into the, the, the cave, like they did in the Chilean miners uh, situation, or we try to pump out the water and drain the water. And until we do, the boys stay inside, or we dive the bowers out. Now this dive out was absolutely, like they couldn't even under, Think about how they would do it. The boys could barely swim. Some of them could barely swim, let alone dive under these circumstances. Recall, this is like over two kilometers worth of tunnels with water in them and deep and caves that are completely uh, uh, submerged in water. How would they dive them out? So the diving out sounded kind of a, a, a long shot. The drilling was also problematic because it would take a long time and they couldn't really, un they didn't really know the implications for the, for the uh, uh, cave structure. And pumping the water again with the monsoons coming, it might take months for them to pump out the exact amount that they needed. They were pretty successful on the entrance area in chamber three, but they knew that there were gonna be real challenges uh, uh, to pump out the water to the degree that they needed to in order to get them out. And so really uh, umming and ahhing and thinking about all of these opportunities and all of these options, they decided, or it became apparent that the only real viable option was to dive the boys out, as crazy as it sounds. And here's where it becomes really interesting, how they started to talk about success and the chances. They did not think that they would get them all out. They started to reframe it from like, what, how many will we save to the fact that they will save anybody. The fact that the alternative is that everybody dies versus saving maybe some of them. They started to kind of think about what is the best way to do it. And suddenly they came up with the idea, maybe we need to sedate the kids. They've, they, they had some struggles with a few of the, uh, of the other, uh, uh, you know, those, those workers, those water workers, other tiny, even Navy SEALs that all got very stressed and panicky underwater. And suddenly uh, 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 John and Rick had the idea to sedate the kids. They contacted Dr. Harris, uh, Richard Harris from Australia, who happens to be an anesthesiologist. And they asked him if he would sedate the kids. And he, his initial reaction was absolutely not. It sounded ludicrous to him to do this, to sedate people, submerge them in water uh, uh, for a journey that was gonna take quite a long time. They realized that they had no, there was no risk-free option. And they realized that of all of these options, they really had to choose the less worse, worse or the less risky option. And so all of these statements on this slide and some that are, are, are mentioned in the case were really ways in which they convinced themselves in some not small part and the authorities to give the approval for the operation. Um, John contacted uh, Dr. Harry and he showed up and he was uh, incredible in his effort. And then they got to work. Now we're suddenly very concrete. The scope is clear. We need to rescue these boys. At first, we had no idea what was going on. And now we know what we're trying to do. We're trying to rescue these boys and we're trying to get them out of the cave. They were safe inside and we had to put them, their lives in danger to get them outside of the cave. But if we left them in there, they would for certain uh, uh, die with the monsoons coming in. So they got all tight with the scope and professional and they started to execute on a plan. Dr. Harris arrived from Australia. He examined their health and he concluded that he could do it. They realized that they needed more expert divers. They contacted a couple of other divers from the UK and they made sure that they brought equipment that was missing. They assessed the equipment. They built a lot of the plan around what they had on site, but they also brought in things like lead or things that were hard to, flop, to find locally in order to enable this very sophisticated operation that they were about to ensue. Sadly, that week, as things were progressing, we're already in J July 6th, so think about it. The boys are still in there. Now they have some food and they have more, more care, but they're still in there. This is already two weeks later, uh, uh, and they're stuck under, underground. Um, and along the way, with the attempts to bring them food and take care of them, one of the Thai Navy SEALs, a retired Navy SEAL, uh, uh, sadly actually died. Um, he struggled to breathe, and he ran, uh, his tank ran out of air signaling and indicating to everybody just how risky 
the situation was, just how tricky this dive was going to be, and really professional, very healthy individuals struggled to do it, um, and it really raised the stake and made everybody aware of the fact that real, real uh, uh, tragedy can occur, and it did uh, uh, with the Thai diver uh, that lost his life. Um, what they did is, again, they, they raised the ante, they practiced, they, the U.S. Uh, Special Forces folks uh, encouraged them to do a rock, to do a rehearsal of, of concept, really a drill. They practiced in the car park, they laid things out, they went into a swimming pool, they brought local boys that weighed about the same. They really tried within a day, you know, within 24 hours, to practice and not take anything for granted and to perfect this plan that was going to be so complex and really so uh, unbelievable to execute. Um, the execution, we're at the end, it is 101, but these are the three days moment of truth. It happened over three days, July 8th to 10th. This was the plan and there's a project plan in the case that, that we compiled. Dr. Harris, the, uh, the cave diver and anesthesiologist, dove in with the expert divers and he was there he interviewed each one of them and he sedated them gave them the first uh, dose of, uh, of anesthesia um, anesthetics and he put them in their you know mask and and put them in there in the in entire um, suit and put them on a, on a basically you'll see in a moment how they were transported in these kind of stretchers um, and he stayed there in the entire day inside the cave just working with each boy at a time the boys decided the order in which they were gonna be saved and they decided that they wanted to be saved based on who lives the farthest. So that, and that boy could be saved and go and tell the other boys' families that everybody else is on their way. Um, four divers uh, were, uh, took active part in it. Each one of them was gonna hold on to a boy that was sedated. These divers, their responsibility was to take the boys that were now uh, uh, under the sedation from chamber nine to chamber three. So to take them really the bulk of the diving and the tricky uh, part out. Uh, they were kind of assigned each one of them to a single boy. They also got some, uh, they were trained on giving more, topping up the anesthetic because it was gonna take three hours. So these things wear off. They were, uh, they were told how to deal with the equipment and, and, and all of the diving gear to make sure that they're in good hands. Along the way, there were other teams supporting them, other divers, international divers, some of which uh, uh, um, I'll mention in a moment. Um, and they were connected to the divers, so they were really kind of tagging along. So these are a little bit of images just to kind of get, get your imagination going on how it looked. Um, a main diver uh, tied to the boy who's on a stretcher, who's kind of sedated and uh, uh, you know, basically sleeping. And from time to time, they stopped to make sure that they were breathing. Um, and this took about three hours. And then at the end in chamber three, the, the stretcher was taken by a group of you know, hundreds of volunteers. They were kind of uh, basically put on a zip line almost to kind of e elevate them to the entrance of the cave. And from there, they were taken to the hospital. Um, it's incredible if you think about it, like how they had to, must have felt to take a boy who's talking to you, who's been in there for you know, over 10 days or two weeks now, um, uh, sedate them and then kind of immer you know, submerge them in water. That, it, 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 the, that feeling is just so uncomfortable and overwhelming. And yet they knew that that was the only way that they could do this and get them out um, safe and sound. Um, and so, all these international people along the way, divers risking them their lives, standing along the way with spare tanks, spare oxygen tanks, there to help with the transitions in some very narrow uh, areas, really everybody putting themselves out there just to be supportive and to help with this mission. Um, luckily, the monsoons also held off. We're now already July 8th, okay? So like this is already into the season. It could have been a downpour, which would have halted. So every moment counts. They only had four masks. So only four masks that would fit the boys. So they can, they were really limited in terms of their ability to be, bring out more than four in one day. So, um, and they planned to do these hot washes, these like almost like sprint reviews after action reviews after every day. And they learned from day to day. And the first day um, was uh, a huge relief and a huge celebration because they were successful in bringing out four boys, one after the other. Uh, the first one, they were, they were, they were just absolutely uh, prepared for the worst, um, but they did it. And that boy got out all the way and went all the way to the hospital and was fine. And after that, three others followed. 
Um, they learned that evening that they need to do minor changes. They had to be careful with, um, of course, not cutting any of the gear, or any of the suits because they had a limited amount. They want, uh, wrote the name of this of the of the uh, child on their arm because they didn't really know their names and they wanted to make sure that they knew what to say at the end as to who this kid is. Um, there were some issues with some of the tanks and, and making sure people topped up. So they learned and they drew some good lessons from one day to the next. Day two. Boys out safe and sound, four more. And again, we, the world was watching. This was unbelievable that they could do it. And day three, after 18 days, all 12 boys and the coach were out safe and sound. And the divers were out. There was that one tra tra tragedy and the, and the death of the Thai Navy uh, SEAL that, that passed away. But otherwise, the boys were out safe and sound. And this operation, this incredibly risky operation, was um, a true success. And so I'm gonna pause here. I have a couple of other slides here, but I know that folks are, are, are you know, we're already running late and this is, um, uh, there's some questions here and I wanna make sure that I pause and say, thank you for sticking with me. Uh, from here on, there's a few more slides that I'll share that are interesting because the nature of the operation from before the boys were found to after the boys were found really changed. The way that we think about ambiguous and chaotic situations where randomness and we need things to happen by chance and we need to enable them to happen by chance versus a well-planned and tight executable uh, 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 project is very different. And the decision-making is very different in either um, set. There was a clear hierarchy of decision-making once the boys were found. There was an, somebody who approved the operation and gave commands. There was a lot of chaos up front. But some of that was needed. Without it, they probably wouldn't have gotten the skill sets to come. They wouldn't have gotten that crowdsourcing capabilities. And they really wouldn't have gotten uh, uh, this uh, speed in which that was vital and fundamental because at, towards the end, the rains were starting. It if they waited a few more days, you know, it, it, it would definitely would have ended in a, in a very different place. I'm gonna pause. I see that there's a few questions. Um, I'll keep here on the slide. I'll leave it with, um, uh, in the background, this notion that there are other crises that we sometimes teach from and learn from and are inspired. Um, and if we had more time, I would ask for some similarities and differences between them. Um, but I'm gonna see, I see that there's a question here. Dave, do you have a uh, uh, sound that you can ask your question or do you want me to, uh, to read it out loud? I think I have sound. Do I have sound? Yes, you do. Thank you. Nice to see. Nice to talk no, to you. Too. That was great. Uh, just such an exciting, dramatic story, and you laid it out so nicely. Um, I was wondering if the the decision to sedate the youth is not something I picked up in the press, and I only, I was only, I knew about it through the documentary, which I recommend. But I know that the choices were limited, but I, I still not. I still don't know if it was objectively a good decision. It fortunately had a good outcome though, but uh, but I don't know how, I'm not sure if it was a good decision. I it's a great question. I think that that's a great question. And um, I agree with you during the days when this was evolved, I, I like I didn't pick up on the fact that they were sedated. I learned this, uh, I learned it pretty early on when I was doing some of the research for this, for this case, but um, you're right. It wasn't something that was necessarily shared very publicly. Um, my sense from talking to, to Dr. Harris, he joined one of my classes this in December, he dialed in from Australia. Um, and so I, I asked, we asked him a little bit about this, you know, he, he didn't think it was a good idea. Like he thought it was ludicrous initially, like, and he was the guy who sedated them. I think some of the, um, the way that it was treated was because he had specific contracts being drawn around his liability. I think that there was a lot of concern that if it got out, that this doctor was sedating these kids, that it would reflect on him personally until they knew that everybody was safe and sound and there was no kind of long-term implications. I think they were keeping, keeping that information pretty tight because getting these, the Thai government, and, and again, this is a fascinating part of this case that uh, we could spend an entire session on alone, the Thai government was very hesitant and, and very reluctant to just let the international team take over. Everything had to be a little bit of a, of a give and take. And when you talk to the Thai government and you kind of understand their perspective, the liability and the idea that foreigners are gonna risk their life, their reputation, their career was not one that the Thai government takes lightly. 
because they respect those individuals. They don't want them, you know, they don't feel that everybody in the world has to give up their, uh, uh, their lives for, for, for the Thai citizens. They, they're, they're very appreciative, of course, but they didn't want to take anything for granted. And the fact that a doctor would do this, that, you know, that they would do this, the, this procedure and risk the, the boys' lives, they knew that that could backlash. You know, he didn't want to be presented as Dr. Evil. You can kind of talk about it uh, to some extent. But I think that that was one of the reasons that they kept that information fairly secretive. Um, but now I think that they're more comfortable sharing. But that's a good point. And whether or not it was a good decision, that, that depends who you talk to. Um, of course, now justifying it, as we know, occurs once we've made decisions. It's hard to disentangle. But it seems like this dive was so technically complex that I... I believe them when they say there really weren't that many options. They could not train these boys to do this dive. This is, some of it was like, you know, 40 minutes, an hour worth of a dive underwater, under conditions that mature grown adults, yourself, you have some diving experience. We would not be able to kind of sustain uh, it without getting all stressed and getting all anxious and claustrophobic. And these kids were already in there for quite a long time. Now, maybe some of them would be okay, but I think the sense was that those chances were even slimmer than having them sedated and, and more easy to manipulate, if you will, as a package um, than them trying to teach them and guide them alive. So hopefully, Dave, that answered. But um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I hear you. And can I add that they did try to, they did take somebody out unsedated, uh, an adult who panicked and, yes. and nearly caused the death of both the diver and the... Yes, that was one of the water workers that were stuck in there that wasn't even all the way in in chamber nine. He was stuck in uh, early on in the cave. And so that was another example of just how difficult it was for them. And another indicator, and, and remember, this was after also the Thai Navy SEAL passed away. So like there was a lot of evidence to suggest that expecting the boys to overcome and to complete this dive uh, and obtain those skills was going to be a, an extreme long shot, uh, probably right. even less, you know, lower risk, uh, higher risk than, than what they um, ended up thank doing. You. Yeah. Great. Uh, uh, thank you so much, guys, uh, for your questions. I see that there are a few more. Uh, um, let me see. Uh, Nadja, do you want to ask your question? I don't know if Nadia. Yeah, yeah I managed to unmute myself. Oh, yes. hi, hi, hi. Uh, you know, just do you think this that was an example of a garbage can decision model where things happen by chance, or at some level there was a kind of management and direction because everyone had the same vision, uh, and uh, and that led to a positive outcome. I definitely think that it depends when in the story you ask. I do think that the garbage can, that approach, that kind of chaos and, and enabling randomness or, or putting in place uh, uh, or lack of mechanism and opening it uh, more like sometimes uh, my co-authors like to talk about a jazz ensemble versus an orchestra, um, but the garbage can model is a good one. Um, I think that that's true for the early part of the, of the whole story until the boys were found. I think once they were found, very quickly, things were well organized and they were orchestrated in a much tighter fashion. Okay, so I think that once they were found and once it was it was really about identifying an op option, working through criteria, making the decision, somebody had to make the decision. There was a much clearer chain of command and hierarchy that led to these uh, to this execution. It was not a by, it was no longer by chance, um, and and I think that that's an interesting feature and one in one of one reason I teach it uh, in my project management course, because it's a very different style, as you know, of decision making and planning, right? Um, and how do you enable that if you're in an organization? Um, how do you allow solutions to emerge when you don't even know who possesses the skill set? Um, interestingly, I've taught it recently, obviously, because I, I finished writing it in 2020. And so a lot of people draw the analogy to what they or their organization or their environment did under COVID conditions, because suddenly, again, it felt like um, we're all thrown into a situation that we don't actually, we didn't know early on, you know, some of us feel like we still don't know what the solution is, who's going to know how to solve this problem, who possesses the, the insight, where's the solution going to emerge from. And so there was a lot more of a sense of let's all try and work in different directions. Let's, uh, in a way, enable chaos and, and competition and multiple parallel trials in order for a solution to emerge. Um, so hopefully that-, that, that Yes, uh, 
Thank you.